Do you remember your first museum visit? Or a time when you felt inspired walking around a museum? What if you had the chance to help give someone their best ever museum memory? Well, now you do. The National Gallery of Art is recruiting for two volunteer opportunities this fall to be one of the friendly faces behind their information desks and the guides who lead their school tours. The National Gallery is hosting information sessions throughout the fall, and they hope you'll join them to learn more and apply. Visit nga.gov slash volunteer for more information. That's nga.gov slash volunteer. Today on CityCast DC, it's no secret that homicides are up in DC. But there's more confusion about why this is happening. Alec McGillis, a reporter for ProPublica, has been writing about violence in America. And one of his reports touched on an idea that hasn't gotten much notice, the idea that social media is propelling the carnage. His most recent piece, which also ran in The Atlantic, involves a killing in D.C. Today is Monday, October 2nd. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what D.C. is talking about. Hey, Alec, thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here, Mike. It's no secret, the spike in the homicides has been big news this year in D.C., the last couple of years in D.C. One of the things that's confounding to me about it is that, you know, in the 80s, last time the numbers were this high, people were able to say, you know, this is a result of a war over drug dealing. And there was sort of an explanation. Nowadays, there's not really a why, but you did this piece with ProPublica that kind of got to one piece of that, which is about how social media is fueling homicide rates. In your piece, you tell this horrific story about a rapper who was shot in DC. Can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, that was a, a classic example of the, this kind of um, vicious back and forth, this cycle online on social media that can lead to deadly violence. Um, you had basically two young men um, going back and forth on social media in sort of late 2019, 2020, there was this whole swirl back and forth. One was spotted on the Metro by some of his rivals, uh, apparently sort of caught naked without a gun in this confrontation. They then proceeded to mock him for having been caught there and a series of Instagram Live sort of taunts. He then, Acta Clicker then put up a whole pretty highly produced um, drill music type video on YouTube um, in which he, you know, a whole a song kind of uh, threatening his his taunters, saying, you know, if only I got a clock, I would come get you with it. That video goes up on YouTube, and a short while later, he was you know, shot dead in Shaw Logan Circle area. There was actually an arrest made in that case of a uh, another rapper called Walk Down Will. That was his performance name, and he pled guilty and was sentenced in the last year or two. I, I use that example actually of of how this kind of this really kind of nasty cycle can work on social media um, because I came across it in a really compelling presentation that was done by the Peace Institute in DC, which is a, a group that's been training, doing lots of trainings of violence interrupters, people who are trying to you know, do, do violence prevention in the district. And there was a special session devoted to drill music and social media instigation and the representatives of the D.C. Attorney General's office who are leading this training use this example of the, the death of Octa Klicka as just a really classic example of how, of how this instigation to violence is happening more and more on social media. They play this in a room and, you, and you're there. What was the reaction? I mean, the, the folks in the room are people who are very familiar with the patterns of violence in the city. What was their reaction to the video as, as it was played? They were stunned. The training was actually being done on Zoom. It was late last year, and at the end of a year that was, you know, a very bad year for DC homicide-wise, though nowhere near as bad as this year turned out to be. And you had these community members, many of them seemed to be middle-aged and older women who have been through, you know, many years or decades of living in, in the district, and they were just stunned by um, by just the the complete, I guess you could call it almost nihilism that you saw uh, on display in, in these videos, just the complete sort of utter meaninglessness of this of this back and forth and this taunting for the sake of taunting and this 
just the, the way in which you can scratch it up in the back and forth. They were aghast about it. And they also, so on the one hand, they found it just completely confounding and bewildering and appalling. And the other hand, one of their first questions was, why hadn't the district tried to get the stuff taken down? And the representative of the attorney general's office who was running the session said that they had made some efforts with the various platforms, the tech giants to take the stuff taken down, and they've been unable to. That it's just really difficult to get responses from the companies, which is what I also found when I reached out to them myself, that these companies seem to be strikingly disengaged from this particular problem. Um, there's so much more attention these days given to what, how we filter or respond to speech that sort of could be construed as political violence, political instigation on social media, on the platforms. There's much less attention um, being given to how we deal with this more routine instigation of violence in the context of just basic urban violence. So the crowd at the training is stunned by this. But as you note, they were mostly, like you and me, middle-aged, so maybe not deep in social media. As it turns out, the shooting of Acticlica and the sort of social media acceleration of the feud that led up to it, how isolated is that as an incident or how common is that as an incident, both in D.C. and uh, elsewhere? It's hard to quantify, of course, because it's hard to know in a given case. It's never you know, stated the way you would state a murder weapon, whether social media played a role in that case. But I trust these workers who are dealing with stuff on a daily basis. And this is what I kept hearing in city after city. And there's a plausibility to this theory because it helps to explain for one of the most upsetting and confounding aspects of this resurgence of violence that we've seen in the last couple of years. And that is that it is so heavily concentrated in young people. The numbers are stunning. The overall rise in homicides nationwide since 2019 is now at roughly, we're roughly 30% above where we were in 2019. So a huge surge nationwide. We went up a ton in 2020, went up somewhat more in 21. But among young people, it's, the numbers are far worse. The number I use in the article is that since 2014, the rise in homicides among 15 to 19 year olds has gone up 91%. So it's almost doubled since 2014. And you see that in, in specific cities. And then you see it in DC, where You've had this overall rise, continued rise of homicides, unlike other cities that have seen a bit of a tick down this year. In DC, it's just been the worst year in several decades, in a couple of decades, and that has included an especially high rate among young people. I think as of the first half of this year, there are even 12 youths killed, which is even more than the year before, than last year, which was a bad year. More than 50 others have been shot without being killed in the first half of this year. So. That's this youth exceptionalism that has been so especially troubling. And the social media explanation is a plausible one for to help explain at least part of that. All right, it's Mike here. If you have been listening to this podcast since the beginning, you've heard me talk about Car Care To Go before. Well, they just changed their name to Rhoda, R-O-D-A, but it is still the same great service. It's made exactly for folks like me who forget about an oil change until the blinking light reminds them, and then forget about it again after I go to the local garage and find out that they're busy. Rhoda simplifies all that. You make an appointment, they pick up your ride, and they bring it back a few hours later with the oil change, the wipers replaced, or any of the other hundreds of services they offer completed. I got a freebie the first time, but the price is pretty good even without it. They're accessible all over DC, and their work is covered by a great warranty to give you peace of mind. Instead of sitting in a waiting room drinking bad coffee, why not sit at home and drink your own coffee while they do the work? Get your first oil change for just $20.23. That's 2023, get it? With the code HEYDC20. That's H-E-Y-D-C-2-0. Sign up at Rhoda.com. That's R-O-D-A dot C-O-M with the code HEYDC20. This episode is brought to you by NASDAQ. Can your question change the world? A question inspires. It dares us to dream, to disrupt. It challenges us to do better, to be better, to create a better tomorrow. So yes, your question can change the world. 
Will you ask it? NASDAQ. Question today. Rewrite tomorrow. Visit rewritetomorrow.com to learn more. How does DC compare to the rest of the country in the social media dimension in terms of the people being able to tease out that aspect of a, a, a situation that leads to violence? The social media aspect is pervasive everywhere. I mean, the fact is, it's just, it is everywhere and this problem is everywhere. One really heartbreaking case that I focused on that actually didn't make the article was left on the, on the cutting floor, unfortunately, was a case in Owensboro, Kentucky, a small city down the Ohio River. And I spent some time there. And that was a case that grew out of a Snapchat um, exchange. A 15 or 16 year old boy was shot and killed um, by a boy that was a, a year or so older. And that had sort of risen out of some taunting, waving a gun around at Snapchat. And which is one of the ways that, that these things happen. You'll have the sort of the allure of notoriety online to be flashing your gun. And that will then either lead the rival, the opponent, to feel threatened and feel the need to, you know, get their own gun and use it, or it'll create the dynamic in which the 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 taunter himself feels some social pressure then to to use the gun having flashed it. But it's, it's so much of it lies in that uh, the draw lies in that initial notoriety that is provided by the platform. So you wrote this in the context of trying to explain this shocking spike in youth violence. But I don't know, plenty of adults are on social media too doing incredibly stupid things. How much of that is a factor in non-youth homicides? Uh, of course, we all do really dumb stuff online and are, are spend too much of our lives online in states. The the fact is though that most of the cases that I found when I was kind of scouring local media for cases in which social media had figured heavily in a violent incident seemed to involve young people. And who knows why that is, whether it's that young people are spending even more time online, especially we have to keep in mind this is all in the context of the pandemic and the post-pandemic period where social interactions, in-person social interactions, you know, were so diminished and online communication, social media communication became even more dominant for young people in the year plus of the school closures. And then on top of that, of course, young people are famously less able to regulate their emotions and responses and and so even more likely than the rest of us to feel strong strong reactions to online online taunts online instigation far more likely to feel real threats to their reputation and their self-worth all the kind of stuff that you know used to make our lives you know as teenagers tough and we all of the years where you feel so insecure you're so worried about your image and your reputation now suddenly in, the, in this new era, you have this worry that this challenge to your, to your image or your reputation has been broadcast so widely. It's being seen by all these people. It's traveling so fast. It's staying up so long, much more so than just some word that was exchanged in the cafeteria or outside school. And, and so you feel this much greater pressure to respond and somehow protect that reputation, protect that name. I was really struck that the DC story in your reporting begins with a confrontation on the Metro. He's on the Metro, he doesn't have a gun, they take video of this. In the quote unquote bad old days, the Metro was never a particular locus of violence. But I think one of the dimensions of this phenomenon is that so much of this is about the public stage that where you can be videoed or taunted in some way. That's a really good point. It's been notable, of course, how many of the shootings this year in DC, the high profile ones have occurred in metro stations, there have been quite a few of them, which has been, of course, so dismaying. And we've seen a, a, another sort of similar example in, in Baltimore, where a lot of the violence against young people, among the young people in Baltimore, has occurred in another space that used to be considered quite off limits, safe space, which was the area around school. And this year, there have been quite a few, just an incredible spate of sh shootings, fatal and on, fatal right on the school perimeter. And so, and several of those were also linked to, to social media instigation. There really has always been kind of a shifting landscape, in a sense, where the violence happens now. I'm curious, the conversation around homicide, at least in D.C. locally, is so 
pitched vicious between participants. You know, either you're a lick spittle for the cops or your wokeness is the cause of all the violence. It was just, it's a very stupid conversation. I'm curious what the reaction to your own reporting has been. It's been tough to write about this. I mean, I do get, one gets a lot of blowback, lots of even backlash when one writes about this subject, but I've been writing about it quite intensively now for the better part of the last eight years since since the spike in violence started in Baltimore following the death of Freddie Gray. And because I just believe that it's, it's unavoidable. It's this huge problem for our cities. There's such loss of life, such pain and trauma, and it can't be avoided. And what's especially upsetting about that polarization is that I, I don't see this as something that necessarily should be so polarizing. There actually does seem to be a way to think about this problem and, and, it, and report on it in a middle ground kind of way, common ground kind of way. There's this notion that if you're writing about um, the rise in violent crime, that you're somehow encouraging excesses in police force. And what a lot of the people who live in these neighborhoods where so much of this violence is so concentrated, what they will tell you is that while they are very worried about, of course, concerned about instances of police brutality and other and excessive police force and, and police harassment, they are also very, very upset about a lack of policing, lack of attention from the police, um, disregard from the police, from police who sit in their cruisers and are not at pursuing violent criminals actively enough in their neighborhoods. And that is just as much of a concern for them. And that has, in fact, been an issue in many cities in these last few years. And what's hard to understand is why the main liberal critique of police has been really been focused around the excessive moments of excessive force and excessive policing, when there's just been this whole other problem, often, of under-policing, if you want to call it that. And that's what people in these neighborhoods feel. They want policing, they want constitutional policing, but they do want policing. So what other concrete steps is DC taking to combat this? And by this, I mean the social media dynamic? DC does seem to be as aware of the prob of this problem as any city that I've that I came across in my reporting. The fact that they're doing these special trainings, the fact just that there's this whole really just a, a quite broad-based concerted effort to train as many people as possible in violence prevention so that it becomes almost a, a really kind of broad-based community sort of practice. That's quite impressive. But the fact is that cities still are at such a loss in, in how to deal with this. In most cities, including DC, your typical violence prevention worker tends to be a often a middle 30-something, 40-something, 50-something African-American male who's often served time for often for, for violent crime in the past, is now out, wants to give back, and is, is now working as often as a full-time violence prevention worker for, for some organization. These, these guys really know what they're doing. They know the neighborhood. They're not so well-versed in the world of social media that's so dominant among young people. And so it's tough for them to go online, at, even know where to begin and how to um, sort of scan for trouble, make sense of, of all the the back and forth, figure out what's actually something you have to worry about. There are researchers who have tried to come up with algorithms to to deal with this, to, to screen social media for signs that someone is likely to commit harm against others or themselves. And yeah, I, I spoke at length with one of these researchers who's now at, at Penn in Philadelphia. He developed this whole algorithm, but he's never actually deployed it, even though it's proved to be quite effective at, at the detection work, because he was just worried that it was too much resembled basically sort of police surveillance, that it was going to end up in some way serving as a, as a sort of profiling in, in its own way. And he's never actually basically given it to violence prevention organizations to use. So there's this wave, just this endless daily wave of just instigation that's flowing back and forth out there. And you have these cities, these community groups that are still really kind of at a loss for, for how I can it. Alec, thank you so much for being here, my friend. Thank you. Before you go, here is some quick news. A review board voted to allow high rises in Northwest DC that are dramatically taller than the current zoning allows. 
Mayor Muriel Bowser wants to amend regulations to allow for high rises of up to 75 feet in Cleveland Park and 90 feet in Woodley Park. Buildings there are currently limited to 40 feet. Meanwhile, the National Park Service plans to upgrade Mount Vernon Trail and the southern section of the GW Memorial Parkway. Their plan includes widening the trails, building better flood infrastructure, repairing a bridge, and adding bike and pedestrian safety features. Plus, there will be new bathrooms, water bottle filling stations, and bike share docks. You have until October 24th to weigh in. And finally, remember when we talked about how it was supposedly okay to go swimming in the Anacostia again? Uh, well, it's a good thing that event got rained out because the Anacostia Watershed Society just gave the river an F in its latest report card assessing the water's health. The society says the lack of submerged aquatic vegetation indicates poor water quality and ecosystem health. There have been impressive strides since cleaning efforts began in 2018. Wildlife has returned and some parts they think may be swimmable by 2025. Just not yet. By the way, what do you think of this newscast? Do you listen to it every day? Is it important to you that we keep doing it? We are debating switching things up and want your input. Click on the really short multiple choice survey in the show notes to weigh in. Thank you. And that's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye.